Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Aaron Elmore. My guest today is Ben Bainan. Ben has a master's in marriage and family therapy from St. Mary's University, and he's currently accruing his hours to become licensed. Ben has taken his experience of becoming an MFT and turned it into a blog aptly named Becoming a Therapist, where he writes a bi-weekly newsletter, hosts a podcast, and is building a community to help a beginning therapist grow. And today we're talking with Ben about the process to becoming a therapist and any helpful tips for pre-licensed therapists. Ben, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Yeah. Thanks so much. So good to be here. I, I'm impressed that you even have the time to do all of this while you're earning your license and that you <laughs> were so helpful to create all these resources for people while you're going through such a stressful time. Yeah, it's been uh, an interesting <clears throat> mix of figuring out yeah how how much uh time i want to spend on this and also just being inspired by kind of my own journey and and what i've gone through so um a lot of that has been motivating beyond just seeing clients and and that sort of thing yeah well let's start there i mean what really did inspire you to create your becoming a therapist blog yeah so it was um about a year and a half, almost two years ago, uh, I'd been practicing, I think for about a year, year and a half. And um, it, it was kind of a, a mix of circumstances from, you know, starting off as a new therapist during COVID and all that that entailed to um, myself getting married and that being a big transition. And then um, a couple other kind of family circumstances, all of it sort of led up to me getting uh, kind of burnt out pretty quick, actually. And um, from that really struggling to balance, you know, helping, helping out my clients while also taking care of myself. And from that, talking to kind of the limited circle of other people, other beginning therapists that I knew and hearing that other people were experiencing a lot of similar things, whether it was burnout or just self-doubt or um, making the transition from being a student to a therapist, a full-time therapist, that sort of thing. So um, after, you know, getting some time to take care of myself and kind of recover from that, I think from that was born sort of this desire or motivation to, help other therapists or felt like there was at least a need there that other people are struggling to. Um, and if, you know, what if I, what, if what I've gone through could help, if I could, um, you know, whether it was through writing or, uh, just encouraging other people, then, um, I'd like to do that anyway I can. So, um, it started out with just, a a blog, um, and it's kind of grown from there as I've, figured out what exactly I want this to look like. Yeah. So it sounds like it really was born out of your own experience and your own struggle. And, um, yeah, as you were speaking, I was reflecting back on my time sort of in that process of shifting from school to licensure. And it is a very draining time, even if you don't have all those extra things going on, like getting married and COVID and all that. I remember feeling very burnt out as well. So I think it's a very common time to be despairing and <laughs> to be mm -hmm. exhausted. So I think it's great that you're creating these resources for people in that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously you've persisted. You're still on the path towards licensure. So mm -hmm. congratulations on not giving up. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. So you alluded to this, but I'm really curious what becoming a therapist, quote unquote, is. I mean, what, so you have a blog, but you alluded to other resources as well. I know there's a podcast. Tell, tell me what really is entailed with becoming a therapist. Yeah. So yeah, it just started off as a blog and me trying to just like self-identify, like what, what, what is this going to be? And okay. so it, it began with just writing, you know, a couple articles here and there, um, but kind of figured out pretty quickly that um, just because if you have, you have a blog doesn't mean people are going to find you. And so um, that transitioned into kind of getting more active on Twitter and actually reaching out to other people who are going through a similar thing or people who are down the road from me. And from there, then it morphed into more of like a newsletter where, um, you know, I can 
send sort of what I'm writing to people directly and say, hey, every other Friday, I, I'm going to write about some topic related to becoming a therapist. If that's something valuable to you, you know, you can hang around here and, and that'd be great. Um, and then semi-recently that that's then morphed into taking what I've been writing about and um, starting a little podcast around that, letting that be a little bit more long form, a little bit more conversational in that sense. Um, and most recently, and, and I'm still working on this now, um, but I think could potentially be the most helpful is starting um, an actual online uh, private community for beginning therapists. So that's been something that I've been kind of building behind the scenes for um, a month or two now. And I'm, I'm really excited for that because that, that's going to be, I think, a place where other um, beginning therapists can actually uh, connect uh, more closely, have space to, you know, talk through these things together. Um, there's also going to be like a mentorship component of it where therapists who are further along are going to be in that space to um, connect with them one-on-one, -on -one, do panels, that sort of thing. So um, I feel like I've been like trying to find my footing of like what is actually valuable to beginning therapists right now. And, and what I've started with the writing podcast seems semi that, but with the community that really feels like that's going to be hopefully um, like directly impactful, something that um, can feel a little bit more substantial and uh, valuable in that sense. At least, at least I'm hoping it will be. Um, yeah, it sounds really great. Honestly, I, I wish there, I knew of something like that when I was at that stage. I mean, I particularly like that idea of having that mentor aspect, um, or maybe not even if it's a formal mentorship, at least resources from therapists who have made it past that burnout stage and, you mm -hmm. know, have succeeded in, in finding a good work-life balance as a therapist. I think that's so helpful to hear during that time when everything mm -hmm. is so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it sounds like you've really built this thing from the ground up and it's going somewhere. It's just exciting. Yeah. I'm, so I'm... as you personally went through, oh, sorry, there was a delay <laughs> in my no audio. Sorry, Peter, go ahead. What were you going to say? Oh yeah. I was going to say, yeah, it definitely has been ground up. A lot of it is, you know, uh, being a beginning therapist, part of it is also kind of me fighting through my own kind of, uh, feelings of self-doubt or, you know, can I help people? Um, and so, but the feedback and, and the connection to people I think has been most helpful is, you know, even if I'm just a couple steps ahead of people doesn't necessarily mean I'm an expert, but maybe there's something there to offer, um, which I think Absolutely. people are responding to. Absolutely. And I think just knowing that people aren't alone in their feelings, because I think after working so hard and investing so many hours and so much money and so much time in a graduate program and then getting to the end and feeling so drained, it really mm -hmm. can create a big imposter syndrome. And I find that people probably don't really want to talk about it because it's a lot to process. And they think, oh, what if something's wrong with me that I'm the only one feeling this way? But it is actually quite a common time to struggle with all of those. So do you mind sharing a bit more about some of your personal experiences or maybe what you're finding therapists typically feel during this stage? You mentioned imposter syndrome, anything mm. else come to mind? For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that that seems to be sort of the buzzword a lot is imposter syndrome. And I think mm -hmm. that's something I've for sure experienced, you know, right out the gate. Um, and I think it's something that just slowly, uh, becomes less and less or easier, but it's something I still experience now. Um, I think especially when I was, uh, burnt out feeling so low energy that, that became all the, the more, uh, intense where, uh, it wasn't just that, you know, I'm worn out and I'm tired, but I'm also questioning, did, did I pick the right field is, do I actually have a, the capacity to be doing this, to be seeing a full caseload of clients week after week after week? Um, and, and like you had mentioned before, I think this transition, that there's so many different factors that are going into making that transition from student to therapist, um, you know, whether it's 
you know, figuring out what kind of theory you're going to focus on or, you know, the financial side of so many people don't get paid when they're in practicum and they have kind of this, uh, there's sort of this ingrained um, sense of, you know, you may not be able to make much after either. And so a lot of people are struggling with the stress that comes with that. And then once you do graduate, um, to, to find any support network can be diff difficult too, because we're all typically kind of holed up in our offices, seeing clients um, hour after hour. And so um, I think, unfortunately, there's just a lot that's really stacked up against beginning therapists that... Um, that make it difficult to um, kind of catch their breath and feel like they're doing enough, um, whether it's professionally, you know, they're growing enough, they're learning enough, um, or even just one-on-one -on -one with their clients. You know, if you're, if you're doubting yourself, it's hard to feel like the work you're doing is actually good work and it's making a difference. Um, I think sometimes it can be rare to get sort of that feedback from clients too, which is no fault to them. You know, that's not their job, but I think beginning, um, starting off, that can be really difficult when you're unsure of what, what do I even offer? What am I bringing to my clients? So, um, yeah, so I, I think I, I for sure experienced that, uh, that feeling of just like self-doubt of feeling like a fraud or imposter of, um, you know, just making that switch from, you know, one day you're not a therapist, you don't have any clients on your caseload to suddenly people are coming to you with really personal and intense and, and real problems and asking you to now be, you know, that person there for them. And, um, and I think it's natural to feel like, wow, this is, this feels like too much, or like, this is really overwhelming, or I don't know what to do. Um, and so I think even like normalizing that for, for people I've noticed of when, when you don't have a lot of people to check in with, when it's just like you and your supervisor checking in week to week, I think it's easy for that to not feel as normal as it really is. Just that sense of this is really difficult work. And um, you know, so many of us don't have the answer, so to speak, uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that doesn't mean you're not a good therapist and doesn't mean that you don't have potential in the field. Yeah. It's, I almost feel like maybe you're articulating the emotional component of the transition from academia to really sitting with people and holding their trauma and their stories, which mm -hmm. is of course what we love. Like that's why we entered the field, but mm -hmm. it feels very different. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes the better we are the more deeply we feel it, which I think is sometimes counterintuitive because maybe not everybody's built that way, but I just mean, there's a lot of empathy that you need to reach clientele and that empathy is draining and it's very different experience, um, going from the supportive structure of having supervisors and colleagues to talk to, to just doing it on your own day in and day out. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very common experience. I also was reflecting too. I, I think there's a lot of um, personal growth that happens during grad programs, especially a therapeutic graduate program, because there's a lot of self-reflection and even just, you know, learning about the theories that we use. We can't help but think about our families and ourselves. And um, I think sometimes that isn't spoken enough about. There's not enough support around that sometimes of the therapist is probably going through some big personality changes as well, or deep reflections as well, and work on top of helping our clients. So there's just a lot to juggle there, I think, is what you're speaking to. For sure. Yeah. And I think that second piece you talked about, like the personal development, um, I think that can kind of get set to the side a lot where there's so much focus on the professional development or the educational piece or, or sort of mastering the theory, ma mastering the, um, you know, different techniques, that, that sort of thing. And, um, and at the same time, you know, when you're trying to develop sort of your professional self, like you're saying th there is, um, I think sort of this necessary personal growth that you go through where, 
um, a lot of the work itself, I think, can become very personal, where it's like touching on things for ourselves that, um, that you know, may, maybe other types of work might not, um, or even up to this point, haven't yet. And um, yeah, I think that can be confusing at first and, and a little chaotic at first when, you know, of course, when people are bringing us their trauma, when they're bringing us their, um, you know, their experiences that that's going to affect us in a certain way. And, um, so it seems to be kind of this balancing of figuring out how, how can I be there for my clients while also figuring out how, how can I cope with what this is bringing up for me? How can I deal with, you know, kind of the emotional upheaval or, or fear or doubt or anxiousness that I'm starting to feel being in the room here with them. Um, and at least for me, I felt like a lot of grad school was really focused and, and maybe necessarily focused on like that professional piece of how can we, um, you know, what can we do for our clients? But I think the majority of the work I've felt like at least these first couple of years has been figuring out how, like, how can I get out of the way of like myself here? How can I get out of the way of my clients here so that I can, um, you know, best serve them. And it, it seems like a lot of the, uh, a lot of what's made it difficult right now is just, yeah, my own experiences of being afraid or being unsure of myself or being anxious or, or feeling these expectations that I need to be, you know, helpful, that I need to make change happen, that I need to meet all the needs of my clients. Um, and that all is just like really complicated work to be doing alongside trying to figure out how to um, do kind of the, the professional side of, of the, the work too. Um, and I guess there isn't like a, set line between the two. I think that mixes a lot, but um, I, I think there, there isn't, at least for me, I haven't, um, it's like I've had to do a lot of that work sort of on my own or really kind of struggle through that. And I think that's a piece where a lot of beginning therapists might feel alone or question themselves or wonder, you know, is anyone else dealing with this or, um, because that is so personal and that is so kind of internal. Um, yeah. And I think just the fact that you're asking those questions and working through that makes you a good therapist, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously I haven't seen your clinical work, but I would assume, um, cause I, I, yeah, I think we reach dangerous territory when we don't explore that and manage that and seek support for ourselves with that. Um, mm -hmm. so again, I think it's wonderful that you're creating a community for people to do just that together. Mm -hmm. I also am reflecting on the time frame because I know you mentioned and and when we were speaking in the intro um, about COVID, and I imagine there's a whole subset of new therapists who are struggling with this so much more than your typical new therapist because they entered the field during COVID. Because mm -hmm. I'm not that much far ahead of you, but I had a few years before COVID to work in the field, and I was so hit hard with usually we're trained, like you mentioned, to get out of the way, right. To manage our mm -hmm. own feelings. Um, so we can help our clients. And if something hits too close to home, we refer out or we get support, but there's an entire two years where we were going through exactly what all of our clients were going through. And mm -hmm. it was very difficult emotionally <laughs> to reach mm -hmm. this deep place where we could support however many people a week when, everything they're saying is also what we are struggling with because nobody had been in a pandemic like that before and all of the mm -hmm. isolation and the anxiety and the stress and the worry and just the toll it took on everybody was very similar even for therapists. So I, I, I imagine that in general, this is a very helpful resource for people, but I, I suspect there's a subset of people in your time frame or around your time frame who are really going to appreciate having this kind of support and are probably struggling a bit more because it typically doesn't feel that heavy when you start out. So starting out in a global pandemic is just, you know, icing on the cake, <laughs> like just hit the <laughs> ground running, figure it out, you know? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think I had, I started the August before 
COVID hit was when I started my practicum. So I had like five, six ish months, maybe before then it went into full lockdown and we're just doing online and all that. So I had a little bit of the taste of, you know, doing the in-person work and, um, and not having, yeah, that extra layer of, you know, stress and heaviness that the the world was experiencing. So, um, but yeah, I, I, th- I think you're right. I think there, um, there's a whole group of us who, uh, who had, yeah, that extra weight of, you know, you're not only trying to figure out how to do this work now, but you're also doing that in an environment that um, is unprecedented. And um, I I think one thing that, you know, I I hesitate to call it a a good thing, but um, part of sort of the stream of marriage and family therapy that I'm in is, is we talk about systems a lot and how systems affect um, individuals and how it affects their, their well being. And so I think being so embedded, not necessarily in a system, but an environment of, uh, of, of stress, of fear, of uncertainty. Um, well, yes, it was probably draining us all the more. I think it did also help um, in the sense where it was, it was really easy to empathize with people, you know, it was really easy to have compassion on, on people when, um, you know, when the, the fear that they're talking about, the uncertainty, they're talking about the loss that they're talking about is the exact same thing that, you know, that we're going through. And so while that it has been a really difficult way to start, I think it might also be a, uh, I think it started us with this perspective of, um, you know, empathy and compassion that, uh, at least to the degree that we had, it might not have been there without that necessarily. Um, so, but yeah, I, I do have to wonder, I, I wish there were statistics on, you know, how many people joined the field that got burnt out and are already done because of COVID I, I've, I've interacted with, you know, at least a couple people, a handful of people who have said, yeah, you know, I, I didn't make it through COVID because of how, you know, how much I just need to take care of myself. And I think that's completely legitimate. Um, and at the same time, unfortunate, because I think having a community, having a place where other people are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm really struggling to, um, I think at least would have been a step in a helpful direction that, that maybe was missed or, or, or wasn't um, available there. And I think that's kind of the hope I have for this community is while we're not in the thick of it now, there are, I mean, there's still, you know, a lot of unprecedented things happening and there's still a lot of systemic pressures and um, stressors happening right now. And And if we can, avoid the uh the added heaviness of doing that in an isolation um i think that could definitely be something positive or or hopefully something to to help kind of turn things around for 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 folks who are struggling absolutely yeah and, and it's like that you alluded to it earlier it's like that support is built in during grad school and then once you're licensed and on your own you have to go find it Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're inundated with something like a global pandemic, it's hard to make the time to find that. Um, For sure. yeah, but I mean, I'm reflecting on my earlier years and I sought out like, um, a consult group and joined a small com- community of like psychologists in the city. And so there are things out there, but I, I do feel like I had to be very intentional and put energy forth to find those. And that can be difficult if you're already feeling like you're underwater a bit. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's great. You're creating a, it sounds like very easily accessible, open community that people can use, um, just for that support. Mm -hmm. Are you finding there's certain common themes that people struggle with in this community or specific questions that come up? I know we've shared a little bit about, you know, your experience and, I concur with some of that, but what are you finding with your specific community? What are the main struggles? Yeah, I think one of the 
loudest things I'm hearing or hearing most often is just the question of like, when, uh, when do I start to feel confident mm. or like, when do I start to kind of settle into this and, and, and feel kind of like, yeah, I've got this or, or I'm doing, I'm doing well here. Um, I think, I think that's definitely tied to sort of that experience of imposter syndrome or, or doubt um and I, I i think that's maybe one of the most prevalent uh feelings or at least pressing feelings it seems like that that's kind of the fear that keeps coming up is um yeah a, a, am i good at this am am i uh am i going to be able to grow in this career and feel like i've i've got it now and i'm, I'm doing well um and that's been helpful to to hear other people voice that because I've definitely felt that and, and do still feel that a lot still and I think a lot of the responses from um therapists and providers who are who have been in the field who have kind of come in and tried to answer to that is um to to some degree it doesn't uh fully go away but um you know, eventually you do get to that point where, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's still there in the background, but it's not getting in the way so much where, where you feel like it, it's uh, kind of invading the room and, and, and you really have to, to fight against it. And, um, and I think I, I've started to, to feel that a little bit where, you know, seeing a new client isn't as nerve wracking as it was before, or, seen a client who's dealing with something that I haven't seen before, or that's not as nerve wracking or, um, you know, even little things like being more okay with silence or being more okay with not, not always having to, to jump in and, and say something. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's, that's one of the most common, um, things I'm, I'm hearing. Um, uh, I think that the second is, um somewhere around kind of the ballpark of like how how do i actually grow how how do i learn how to do this work better and and i think one piece of that is is there's almost like so many options as far as like when it comes to like theories or techniques or interventions or trainings or or that sort of thing um and so i think you know, part of what is feeding that is still that fear, that concern of, you know, I'm not confident, I'm not, I'm not good enough, or I'm not doing well. And so then kind of the next question is, well, how do I, how do I get confident? How do I get better? How do I grow? Um, and I think that can, yeah, that can be really hard too, because it, there isn't, um, you know, we have kind of the paths of each of our licensures, which is helpful to sort of narrow the, the field a little bit of, of how we, get trained, how we get better. But on like a day-to-day -day basis, I think a lot of people maybe feel that they're sort of just hopping to the next session and trying to do the best they can, um, maybe reflecting a little bit on it afterwards, but then just hopping in, you know, right into the next one. Um, and I think that's really understandable because I think there's, yeah, just a lot of pressure to, to see your clients and to have a full caseload. And, um, so I think that's one thing I've been reflecting on or, or trying to figure out is, is there ways to help kind of guide that growth process or at least, um, at least have either resources or encouragement that, um, you know, either saying, Hey, this is what you can do to grow or, Hey, you're doing enough already. Like you're doing great. You're right on track here. You don't have to worry about that. Cause I think that's sort of the spectrum is, um, you know, never feeling like I'm doing enough or, um, you know, not actually investing at all in your own growth and, and not knowing where to start. Um, so yeah, I think that, that that's probably the second thing I hear most often. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like trying to figure out what was helpful with the structure of the grad program and carrying that through to quote unquote real life. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause it's not automatically built in there um, mm -hmm. and preserving the desire to help. Cause really all of this 
anxiety is, is coming from a desire to be helpful, right? Mm-hmm. So it's preserving that want to help our clients without letting that take over our confidence. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but there is a huge jump from grad school to private practice life and from being a student to being a clinician full-time. So Mm -hmm. can you share a little bit more about that difficulty and just for our listeners who are like, yes, that's me, (laughs) help them, help them understand what's, what's hard about that and what's normal about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, yeah, that again, that, yeah, that is such a difficult transition. Um, I kind of think of it in like three sort of stages, which I think are fairly universal regardless of what license you're getting but there's you know obviously grad school and then typically you have like a practicum or an internship where you're still in grad school but you're accruing hours and then once you have enough hours you graduate and then you're in like the pre-licensure phase of okay now I'm accruing hours I'm studying to take the test I'm working now usually I'm actually getting paid now and then after that sort of it's somewhat freedom Uh, you know, beyond that, where um, you're not in this process of getting licensed. So um, from the grad school phase to to practicum, I think, you know, the obvious first, and I think scariest hurdle for a lot of people is seeing that first client, that that feels like the biggest jump from, again, I, you know, maybe we did some, you know, practice sessions in, in grad school, and maybe we, we, saw our professor, you know, even see some clients, but we weren't actually in the chair. We weren't sitting there yet. And I will um, forever remember my first client. I remember sweating, driving to the community (laughs) clinic. And it was literally just one client, one client, but I will always remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everyone does. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Same, same here. And there's something about that, that is just such like a switch of like, oh my gosh, this is official now. Um, almost like this, it's too late to, to, to stop now. I've, I've, you're sort of being pushed into it, which um, it's scary. It's nerve wracking. I think part of that, like you can't avoid, like that's going to be there. Um, and that's okay. Uh, and so I, I think that's the first hurdle. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I would just want to reassure, I guess, as much anyone who's hasn't hit that yet or is about to hit that change that you know everyone experiences that same level of fear and uncertainty everyone's as prepared as they can be and still you know unprepared in a sense for for that um and yeah so i I think that that's kind of the the first place of, of difficulty that people hit um and I think even in that, that, that can be staggered sometimes. Like for my practicum, we like got handed clients right away and we weren't, you know, the, my supervisor wasn't in the room. Um, there wasn't a two-way mirror. It was just me and my client, which was incredibly frightening at first, but I was kind of thankful for that, that it wasn't this gradual process of, you know, watching my supervisor and then doing co-therapy and, and that sort of thing. Um, I think that might build up kind of the nerves a little bit, but um, yeah. So I, I think that first uh, first client is definitely kind of the the first place of difficulty we we hit. Um, I think sort of what happens after that, at least what I experienced, was uh, a, a lot of what I was getting supervision on. A lot of what I was hearing was, you know, just make it through your first session. You know, just listen you know, be, uh, be warm and still some sense of hope and just make it through that. And then, you know, and then we'll talk about what, what to do next. But I think the, you know, what we do next after that is then just this huge sort of chasm of, okay, now, you know, I, 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 my client came back, that's great, but now they're still sitting here wanting me to do something about this or, or expecting me to, to help in a certain way. Or, um, and I think that's when sort of the, uh, the next kind of stage of fear kicks in of, um, 
I think that's when a lot of the doubt kicks in. And then a lot of that urgency of, okay, I really need to, to kick it into high gear here. I really need to grow quick so that I can help these clients so that I can fix their problems. Um, and I, and I remember, you know, bringing my textbooks to the office and before sessions, like picking a theory, picking an intervention and just hoping that like I, can, I could incorporate that some way or that that would work. Um, but I think what eventually started to take place was that, you know, a lot of the advice for the first session of just being there, just listening, um, being mindful of what you're experiencing, what you're feeling, um, being warm, being compassionate, being human, you know, not, uh, not trying to force anything. Like, I think a lot of that started to bleed into the next stage and it seemed like, oh, my clients are reacting really well when I uh, embody kind of those same things that I tried to do that first session. And I think that became sort of at least sort of a, a little safe haven of, okay, I can try to do that better. I can try to be better at being present. I can try to be better at not you know, just feeling the silence to fill the silence. I can try to be better at expressing and showing warmth and compassion. Um, Cause that's all stuff that I already kind of knew how to do beforehand. I think everyone who sort of joins the field has at least an inherent sense of being a helpful or a warm type of person. And behind that has that desire to help. And um I think a lot of times that we just feel like that's not enough that we need to have, you know, fancy skills or, or techniques or things to be that kind of special sauce that, you know, fixes everyone's problems. But, um, and sometimes the clients expect that. Right. And I think that's part sure. of the, uh, I guess, psychoeducation around therapy too, is that, I think as helpers, we need to remind ourselves, at least I had to all the time of like, that's their life. It's not my life. And uh, mm -hmm. our program, they taught us, you can't work harder than your client. So you can mm -hmm. show up as much as you can, but ultimately it's, it's the responsibility is on them, not us. And I think as helpers, it's easy to put that pressure on ourselves, especially as new therapists. Cause there's, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, there's literally an actual human being <laughs> sitting so close to you, sharing and trusting you with very deep information. It's honoring, but it, you want to help so badly that sometimes you can't think clearly. And I think that's mm -hmm. part of the adjustment from student to therapist is mm -hmm. trusting the process as they say. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And, and in our program, they said, um, the goal of the first session is to have a second session. So I was laughing when you said they came back because that's a good first session. <laughs> <laughs> and then that second phase you're talking about where you're like, okay, now what, like, what if I run out of skills or what if I don't know mm -hmm. everything or, you know, then they, mm -hmm. they taught us, um, th there, obviously there's a lot of interventions that you want to learn and can use, and you want to be doing something. It's not that you don't have a treatment plan, but mm -hmm. all the research shows the most important thing that helps people is actually the relationship. So our program always taught us, okay, even though you have all these, this, these skills that you're going to learn, you can always learn more bottom line, it's the connection. And so I think that's what you're mm -hmm. speaking to, where it's just quieting down and staying connected to that person and really hearing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I appreciate what you said about um, that sense that, yeah, our, our clients do come in with a lot of expectations too, of what yeah. the work is going to look like. And, and they're I think stressed that, out. They want help, I, you know? Yeah. yeah, of course. And I think that that can be difficult because at least for me, it was easy to sort of turn into a yes person of like, oh, yes, of course, I can meet all of your expectations. Right. Of course, since you have these expectations for me, okay, I guess it's on me now to to do this. Yeah. And yes, there should be a certain level of expectation that, you know, they're, they're coming to us for help or, or there should be a um, sense of change. But at the same time, I think one of the biggest things I had to learn my first year was understanding what my limits actually are of like, what, what can I actually offer here and what's beyond my scope of practice? What's beyond what I can actually offer. And can I be okay expressing that can be okay saying, you know, Hey, th this is what I can do here for you. This is what we can do together. 
and um and and then being okay with what what I can't do or what what isn't possible um and that's really hard because when you're just starting like you know you write your bio for your website or whatever and say oh you know, that's person like centered that's so or I'm, yeah <laughs> and, and, you, and you kind of fill it with all the filler of what you learned in grad school of what you think you might offer but you don't have like a felt embodied sense of like when you come to my office this is what I'm gonna offer for you this is what you can expect and that's such a vulnerable place I think for new therapists to because that takes time it takes time to develop that yeah for sure yeah so I, I think wonder that's, oh yeah, go god ahead. I'm so sorry you go ahead oh no I was just gonna say I think that's what a lot of new therapists feel really vulnerable about and feel uncertain about is saying, you know, th this is what I offer, but I'm not sure how I'm going to offer this to you. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what this is going to look like. Um, and I, I think sort of discerning or, or making, getting a better understanding as you go along of, you know, this is what I can offer. This isn't what part, this isn't what therapy is, or this is what therapy is. This isn't what therapy with me looks like. Um, that they, yeah, like you said, that just takes time to develop and understand. And that's okay to not have that like full assurance day one. Of, yes, that's exactly this is what, what I, I was going to say. Yeah, it's making me, maybe I'm ignorant about this topic, but I'm wondering if there are any theories or research out there about the development of a therapist. And it's reminding me almost of our, you know, child development theories where mm -hmm. certain ages, the question is literally like, am I capable? Can I do this? And mm -hmm. I feel like that's the the first client stage. And then the second one is like, okay, but like, how far can I do this? And how do mm -hmm. I do this well? And mm -hmm. I want there maybe, and I just not aware, but I wonder if there, maybe that could be something to include in your um, community is just general mm -hmm. knowledge of here are the stages that most therapists go through as they reach this point of more confidence. Mm -hmm. um, Cause to your point, I think we put pressure on ourselves because we're graduated, we're licensed, we've done it, right? We're supposed to be great, but really mm -hmm. it's an ever evolving process. Just like any other career, the more hours you put in, the more expertise you have and the more comfortable you are. And so I think taking that pressure off a new therapist to be acting like a, someone who's been licensed for 20 years, you know, you, you really mm -hmm. don't have to be at that stage immediately. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. And obviously you really want to help people because you're not only helping your clients, but you created this whole community to help therapists as well. Um, do you have a story that comes to mind of someone who was really helped by your community or your blog or your podcast? Um, there, there's like specific people I've heard from, I'd say it's more, uh, more like a joint sentiment of like a conglomerate mm -hmm. of a lot of people that I've heard from. And I think one of the biggest things, um, well, one of the, yeah, one of the biggest things has been, thank you for seeing me, you know, thank you for mm. speaking to this. Um, and yeah, I, I think we've talked about this already, but, um, I don't know if it's just that sense of isolation or that sense of comparison or um, self-doubt or, or whatever it is, but it seems like there, there's a lot of us folks that um, really do feel like this is an individual experience or this is just me going through this or there's something wrong with me or there's something not good enough about me um, or the work that I do. And um so I, I think that was kind of surprising at at first because that was just coming from me expressing, hey, this is what I've gone through or this is what I'm going through right now. And I wasn't offering any like answers to that or I wasn't saying, hey, this is how you get out of it or this is how you get through it. it so just... ironically, it's what we were just talking about, about how just showing up mm -hmm. and being there is actually what's helpful, right? It's like a parallel yeah. process. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> You're a good therapist. <laughs> Thanks. That's why people pay me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but it's just because I'm listening to you say it. So mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's, it's the same thing. It sounds like I'm sure there are people that are significantly helped by your community, but yeah, it sounds like 
what people need at that stage is just to know they're not alone and to have someone else to talk to about it and potentially Mm -hmm. some resources, but really just knowing this is a normal part of the process Mm -hmm. and a normal stage to be in. And that takes a lot of the anxiety away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think the flip side of that is I, I have tried to outline a little bit of like how I've grown or like what I've done to um, feel a little bit more confident or what I've done to, um, you know, kind of excel my craft or, or whatever you want to call it. And I think that then on the flip side too is, oh, thank you for sharing at least some like kind of stepping stones or some totally. place to start at least with totally. us. Um, so I think there, yeah, there's that balance of just showing up and, you know, expressing what I've been experiencing and also trying to have some practicals or have some, some to do's or some, um, here's how, here's how I did it to float out there at least as, Hey, maybe try this or, yeah. um, and I think even if that doesn't like work or even if that doesn't, you know, fit their experience or isn't completely helpful, I, I think at least it gives a sense of ease of th- there's something I can do. There's something I can try. Um, and, and beyond that, then hopefully that at least sparks some curiosity of, okay, if this didn't work, what, what's something adjacent to this that I could try or, or what's something like this that might work a little bit better for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather have a therapist who is trying and learning and, you know, working on this stuff than someone who has a false sense of confidence. So mm-hmm. I hope your, your community can keep that message and hold that for each other. They're mm-hmm. probably doing so much better than they think they are just because mm-hmm. they're seeking out that support, you know? Mm-hmm. For sure. Is there any message as we wrap up that you might want to leave with early career practitioners who are listening? Um, <clears throat> I think just speaking to what I've heard, uh, and obviously this isn't for everyone, but I think for the majority having, um, more gentleness on ourselves. I think having more compassion for ourselves um, never hurts. I think that's something that typically as helpers, we're we're so others focused and like others oriented that, you know, ironically, we can leave ourselves kind of in the dust or we can forget about ourselves a lot. Um, And especially when you're just starting out, when when you feel that immense pressure of I've got to be good enough or I've got to show up for my clients. I have to make it happen. I have to make it work. I think it's so easily we kind of leave ourselves to the side and and forget um, or just even aren't in tune with what we're experiencing. Um, So I, I think, you know, one practical thing would just be to allow yourself to have one time a week to sit down and ask yourself, you know, how am I being affected by this work? You know, what, what was happening in me, you know, maybe in my toughest session this week, what was going on with that? Mm -hmm. What was I feeling? How did I take that with me throughout the week? And then moving into like, what do I need? What what am I longing for? What would be helpful here? Um, So kind of have supervision with yourself. Sure. Yeah. 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 I think for sure that, um, and then, you know, hopefully that can be something that then we br- bring to to other people, whether it's yes. your supervisor or, um, you know, obviously we, th- there, there's a certain level of distance we have from our family and friends because we can't bring everything to them, but I think we can still bring what we're feeling, mm-hmm. you know, what we're going through, what we're needing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think at, at least prioritizing vocalizing that rather than internalizing all of that um, was at least helpful for me when I started to make that switch. Um, And I think you're right. You said it earlier that we just get so busy. It's easy to go from one session to the next. And I think Mm -hmm. for me, it was the same, very helpful. I had to carve out, I basically scheduled a session with myself once a week, Mm -hmm. at least sometimes if it was a busy week, maybe like two a week where maybe I didn't Mm -hmm. eat lunch or like lay on my couch or whatever, but I had to 
think through what am I doing with these cases and these people? And it mm-hmm. helped me organize, okay, this one's okay. Oh, I need to print something for this one. Oh, this one, I really need consultation around. Let me, let me text somebody right now and schedule a time to consult. And so I think that structure was very helpful for me as well as just making some time to do what we used to do in school, which is slow down, mm-hmm. reflect, figure out what we need to do for our clients and then leave it and go home, you know? Mm-hmm. So I like that advice quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And as we're wrapping up today, help us learn a little bit more about what's coming up for you with the community that you're building um, and where people can find resources related to your, uh, Peter, I'm going to do that again. <laughs> so the community is called becoming a therapist, right? That's a, that's the name of um, it. The, the community doesn't actually have a, a name yet. Becoming okay. That's a why I'm struggling. It's just okay. the, the website. Yeah. That's just the website. Okay. Yeah. I'll rephrase that. Okay. Well, Ben, as we wrap up today, can you tell us a little bit more about what's coming next for this online community that you have and maybe where people can find your website? Yeah, for sure. So um, the website, which is kind of the hub for any of these resources I have, um, it's uh, becomingatherapist.me, M-E. Um, and so there you can find uh, like where to sign up for the newsletter, where to find the podcast. And then eventually when the community is live, um, there'll be a, like a portal for that as well. So, um, if you want to like stay up to date on when the community is going to be launching, I'm going to start by sending anyone who's subscribed to the newsletter, um, kind of an opportunity to jump on it early. Um, so that'd be the best way to stay up to date with that. Uh, there, there isn't necessarily like a set timeline for when the community is going to launch, but I'm hoping it's going to be within um, a month or two here um, for sure by, by the new year. So um, yeah, just getting really excited for that. I'm talking to mentors at this point right now who are going to be part of the community. who are going to be there to, to walk alongside um, those of you who are beginning therapists. And I think that's going to be an excellent resource. Um, so that's the other thing. If you are kind of a more experienced therapist and want to be a mentor, I'm also looking for more folks for that as well. Um, so you can, uh, you can find, uh, the, the newsletter there and, and then just reach out by email and, and get in touch with that. But, um, yeah, really excited for it. Hoping it can be, uh, something beneficial for, uh, for beginning therapists here. I'm sure it will. I'm, I'm excited for that to launch too. And I just want to thank you for your vulnerability. I mean, you know, you didn't have to share all of that, but I, I think it was really nice to hear your experience. And I'm sure so many of our listeners relate to what you're saying. Cause I know I do. Um, so thank you so much for being here today and, and letting us know about this amazing community that you're creating. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for having me. It's been, yeah. it's been great talking with you. Good. I also want to remind our listeners that this episode, its resources, and all of our other shows can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. Visit triadhq.com slash BHT today and explore our archive. And finally, we want to thank you, our listeners, for joining in on the conversation. We appreciate you being here with us and look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today.